Edward mentioned the harvest party. Someone asked me if a Spider-Man costume's okay. I said, sure. We don't want any witches, demons, warlocks, nasty, bloody things like that, and definitely no Hillary or Trump masks. <laughs> we gotta draw the line somewhere. On a serious note, not that that's not serious, but on a serious note, these bylaws are very important today because of the issues that are facing the church. The landscape is changing rapidly. We are um, pastors, and uh, Steve Nemeth will be heading down to um, this week a, a pastor's conference at uh, Shepherd Seminary in Cary, North Carolina. And one of the prominent speakers there is David Gibbs. He's an attorney and he's an expert in church law. In fact, we have him on retainer here. The things that are facing the church are very different than they used to be. It used to be you'd go to a pastor's conference and they'd just preach Holy Spirit, skin you alive, and you go back home. Now you go and you learn about how not to get sued, what to say, what not to say, et cetera, et cetera. And from year to year, they change and things become a little bit more difficult. And so uh, I expect that as time goes by that even the bylaws that uh, we're asking you to approve are going to change too. I think with the, the passing of time and these issues that are, are just coming at us quickly, um, it's, it's becoming a very complex thing. And I believe that there are days ahead where we as a church are going to be severely challenged in how we do church and how we're allowed to practice church. I don't think things are going to stay the same. I really believe that we are living in a time that is going to cause us to have to move on certain things. And when I'm saying that, I'm not certainly not talking about the Bible, but um, how we operate day to day. And I think you'll see that uh, over time. So there are some things there that really, uh, really do concern us. We are in Joshua chapter 3 this morning. And if you have need of a Bible, these gentlemen would be happy to place one in your hand. Joshua chapter 3 is an exciting passage of Scripture. Joshua chapter 3 has one of the most exciting miracles in all of the Bible right there on its pages. And we sometimes miss it. The title of the message here, The Wonder of God. God is an amazing God. It is just absolutely incredible what our God is doing and what he has done. In Joshua chapter 3, we have learned something that's important. Last Sunday, we talked about consecration. We talked about the significance of being set aside to God. And understand this, that when we talk about being set apart and sanctified or consecrated, what we're talking about here is something that's already happened. God has set us, church, aside to himself. And he will present himself with the bride blameless and holy. This is why it's so important for us to understand Peter's words where God instructs us, be ye holy as I am holy. The Sabbath day in the Old Testament was set aside to God. Who set that aside? God did. He set it aside to himself. He took his chosen people, Israel. He set them aside to himself. He takes the church. He takes you if you are a person of faith here today, and he has set you aside to himself. That's consecration. In return, we're to set ourselves apart to God as well. And sanctification was absolutely significant in verse 5 here at Joshua 3. Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. God is doing wonders. That word wonders in the Hebrew most closely associates itself with miracles. Our God is a God of miracles. And I'm not talking about small miracles. I'm talking about ginormous miracles. God wants us to know, as he wants the people of Israel to know, that there is absolutely nothing that he is not capable of. 
God is the one who created all of us. God is the one who spoke into existence the very world in which we have our being and take our breath. It is God who has done all of these great things because our God is omnipotent, which means he is all-powerful. And when we come to Joshua chapter 3, we are going to witness one of the biggest miracles that there ever has been in the history of the world. You say, Pastor Kevin, that's a, that's a pretty big claim. But I'll stand behind it as we go through Joshua chapter 3. Let's pray and ask God to bless his word then to our hearts. Father, we thank you that you are a God of miracles. Lord, it took a miracle to save me from my sin. It took Jesus to come and to die for me, to conquer death and the pain and the penalty of it by rising from that dead grave. And you give to us now, Lord, all who will come to you in faith, eternal life, and that's a miracle. You saved us from our sin. You've given us a new nature. You've placed your Holy Spirit in us. Father, we are blessed to see your miraculous power working out in our lives. Bless the word of God now, I pray. May you allow your spirit to work in and through it, to apply it to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. After God said to the people of Israel through Joshua, it's going to be important that you set yourself apart to me. He goes on here in this passage of scripture, and I draw your attention to verse seven. For not only do we see consecration involved here, but we see exaltation. In verse seven, it says here, the Lord said to Joshua, this day I'll begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. You shall moreover command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you'll stand still in the Jordan. You see, this was an important step in all of Israel's future. The understanding that Joshua is going to be singled out and exalted so that the people would understand who he is. There was no election here. There was nobody casting a vote. God was the one who selected the leader after Moses had died. And he takes Joshua, a normal man, a man like you and me, and he appoints him to a very, very important spot. Remember, the people of Israel heard from the Lord through the prophet of God. Moses heard from God, and Moses gave instruction then as if from the mouth of God to the ears of the people of Israel. He comes down from the mount, and he's got the commandments there. He's got the tablets, and he's got them all written out there. God places them into his hand, and he takes them to the people. It was absolutely vital that the people who have been known to challenge the leadership of Israel, it was absolutely imperative for them to recognize that God's hand was on Joshua. And so God says to Joshua, I'm just starting now to exalt you before these people. You see, these people aren't always going to love you like I love you. Uh, They're going to to struggle with your leadership. But right from the start, we've already seen that Joshua's leadership skills. He's already instructing the priests. And so the priests were going to need to listen to God. And that message was going to come through his servant, Joshua. How important it is for him to be the person who is leading the people because he is the one who is the spokesman for Almighty God. And the people were going to know that they need Joshua's leadership. They are in a terrible spot. They are on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Where are we going? What are we doing? And God is speaking to one man. We're all going to die unless God has a plan. We're all going to die if our leader doesn't follow God. How important it was for Joshua to be exalted in the midst of the people. Because God was going to do a great thing. And the anticipation was absolutely exciting. I think of the anticipation that was going to go on there. How the people were probably buzzing about this crossing. This is pretty exciting stuff, isn't it? This is really amazing. 
And yet we know that the people didn't always have the right perspective. Let's go on a little journey. Let's take our Bibles and let's go back to the preceding book, the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, Deuteronomy chapter 9, in verse 1. This passage of Scripture is fairly amazing. God says to the people of Israel, Hear, O Israel, you are crossing over the Jordan today to go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than you, great cities fortified to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of the Anakim, whom you know and whom you heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? The people of Israel were facing some enormous challenges. Once they got across this crazy river, there'd be giants on the other side. There was going to be more giants there by far than what they've encountered with Og and Zion. The Amorite people were people who were known to be as tall as the cedars, mighty as oaks. And those cities that they were going to have to take on were fortified cities. And the Bible says that God said to them, these fortified cities, man, they go up to the heavens. These walls are huge. Verse 3 says, know therefore today that it's the Lord your God who is crossing over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and he will subdue them before you so that you may drive them out and destroy them quickly just as the Lord has spoken to you. Make no mistake about it. It is God who is going before the people of Israel. And God says, I'm going across that river myself and I am a consuming fire. You come and you follow me. And I'll dispossess these nations before you. I will give this land that's flowing with milk and honey to you. You will have it. And he says, it won't take that long. He says, it's going to happen quickly. I told you some time ago, I was in an accident back right after the 4th of July. I'm still driving the rental car. <laughs> it's over 100 days they're trying to put this truck back together. Anybody want to buy a truck? <laughs> I don't believe that it's going to take a hundred days for the people of Israel to take on that promised land and see the victory won. I think it's less time than it takes to fix a truck. You see, God is a God of all consuming fire. And when God says this is going to happen quickly, I believe that that is going to take a very small percentage of time. That the objective is to go into the promised land, to take this land and exalt the name of God. And that's not going to take forever. It might take forever for me to get my truck back. But the people of Israel are going to go in. Now notice what he says after this in the same passage. He says, do not say in your heart when the Lord your God has driven them out before you, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Oh, I guess we're pretty good, you know. Look at what's happened. We are in the promised land. It's because of our goodness. It's because of our righteousness that this has happened. God is saying, listen, folks, don't you dare say that it's your job or your righteousness that made this happen. My friends, it's never our righteousness, is it? The Bible has been very clear that you and I cannot gain entrance into heaven based upon our righteousness. For all of our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of the Lord. There is none that doeth good. How many? No, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one of us that should stand before God or stand before God's people today with an ounce of pride because it is all God all the time. He is the consuming fire. He is the one who has wrought salvation full and free for us on the cross of Calvary. See, it is our God who is doing these wonderful things. And in that same passage, he says here, but it's because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is dispossessing them before you. Verse 5, he reiterates again. He says, it's not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you're going to possess this land. But it's because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God is driving them out before you in order to confirm the oath which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Know then, verse 6, it's not because of your righteousness. Did you catch how many times God said it's not because of your righteousness? 
He keeps repeating it over and over again like they're somehow dense. You and I are somewhat dense. There should be, and I could get on a hobby horse here, but there should be no pride in the church. We should be the one place where you'd find humility, right? But we say, oh, yeah, well, you know, I got a great track record. It's like, you know, you don't get into heaven because of anything that you are but by the grace of God. Now, here's the point I want you to look at with me, Deuteronomy chapter 9. God says that there's a reason why you're going to go in and dispossess the land. I'm going to use you, God says, as a tool that brings judgment to a very, very wicked people. These people are so wicked in their sinfulness that you need to be reminded that their sinfulness justifies the punishment that will come upon them. Notice with me in Deuteronomy chapter 20. In Deuteronomy chapter 20. Because some people will ask the question, is God right in allowing the people of Israel to go into an already settled area and take this area over? That doesn't sound kind. That doesn't sound loving. Where is the love of God in this? Well, I want you to see here that what God is doing is he's using Israel as a tool because of the wickedness of these people. Go with me here and look at Deuteronomy 20 and verse 10. It says that the people of Israel, when they approach a city to fight against it, you will offer it terms of peace. If it agrees to make peace with you and opens to you, all the people who are found in it shall become your forced labor and shall serve you. In other words, they won't die. But remember this, that all of the land that's been promised to the people of Israel has been promised to the people of Israel. It belongs to God, and God says, I can give it to whoever I wish to give it. And he will give it now to the people of Israel. Now, there's an exception here that's very worth noting. He says, if they don't take your peace agreement, but make war against you, he says, you'll besiege it. When the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you'll strike all the men in it with the edge of the sword. It is God who will give it. Again, the people of Israel are doing nothing but relying on God. This will be the way with the cities that are afar off. Verse 15 says, Thus you'll do to all the cities that are very far from you, which are not of the cities of these nations nearby. You see, the nations nearby were the Canaanites. And God says this, verse 16, Only in the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, you shall not leave alive anything that breathes. Now God is pretty clear there, isn't he? There's not a lot of misunderstanding that should come from that understanding, that simple words. He says, but you'll utterly destroy them. And he mentions all the different ites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Parasites, any kind of ite. But but the key is they all come under the umbrella of the Canaanites. So when he says, I want you to wipe out the Canaanites, there are about eight or nine groups that fall under that umbrella. This is the reason why this was so important. He says in verse 18, so that they may not teach you to do according to all their detestable things which they've done for their gods, so that you would sin against the Lord your God. The Canaanites are singled out for severe treatment. My friends, God is a God who notices wickedness. You stop and you look back all the way back to the Tower of Babel. And man came together to exalt himself to the heavens and take over the authority of God. And God looked down and he saw it and he said, that's it, if I let it go any further, they'll keep right on coming. And he said, that's it, I'm wiping this out. And I'm going to further judge mankind by spreading them out. We don't have to think too long to think about another time when man was judged, and that was during the times of Noah. A time that will become futuristic as well. 
And as it were, as it was in the times of Noah, mankind was eating, drinking, so forth and so on. That's yet future. But in Noah's day, God said, I've had it with the sin of the world. And there was Noah, and God said, I'm going to spare him, I'm going to spare his family. And he said, I'm going to allow him to build an ark that he's going to be able to survive this tremendous judgment of mine. God is a God who looks upon humanity and he recognizes the wickedness of humanity. The Canaanites were a people, they were known to burn their children in honor of their gods when they needed something particularly um, significant. They would offer sacrifices and they would sacrifice their own children. Leviticus chapter 18 goes into all of the sin that was rampant at the time. There was homosexuality, there was sodomy, there was bestiality. Uh, These people were into witchcraft, they were into all types of sin. And the land itself, it says, begins to vomit them out as a body heaves under the load of internal poisons. You see, this was a wicked people. And what I'd like for you to do is take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16. I'll show you an interesting verse of scripture here that definitely applies to things. Remember, it was God who said to Abraham, of you, Abraham, I'm going to build of you a a great nation. Abraham's promised a son in chapter 15. And all of these promises are going forth. And he says, then in the fourth generation of verse 16, he says, in the fourth generation they'll return here for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. God was even taking note of the sin of the Amorites. He's looking upon this world and he's seeing the wickedness. He's seeing the sinfulness. When we studied the book of Daniel this past summer, we got into a passage of scripture in Zechariah. In Zechariah, God was talking about the smiths or the craftsmen. The idea was someone, not like Smith and Jones, but someone who is holding on to a hammer like a blacksmith. And he would raise up his mighty arm with that mighty hammer and it would come crashing down on the anvil. And God said, I have this great nation of Egypt, but I'm going to raise up another nation, and it is going to pound that one down. And I'm going to raise up the Amorites, and bang, the Babylonians are going to, and I'm going to raise up that Rome is going to come down as that smith. And we know that in the end times with the revived Roman Empire, Jesus Christ is that final smith, the final hand of judgment. And it will come crashing down, and it is that Smith that is left yet future, everything else is past just as prophesied. You see, when God looks at the wickedness in the world today, he's recognizing that this wickedness can't go on forever. You may struggle with the aspect of God's judgment upon the Canaanites, but he is fully justified in doing so. For he alone is holy. Notice with me here in Joshua chapter 3 in verse 10. Joshua said to the sons of Israel, come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you. And that he will assuredly dispossess from before you the Canaanite, Hittite, and so forth. He goes through the list. By this you shall know. God is going to do a great work. God is going to bring judgment. You and I today live in a time when I believe God will bring judgment sooner than later. I don't say this because I'm old. I was golfing the fundraiser with uh, John Evans and Good News Jail Ministries, and they said that if you were 60 years old, you could hit from the tees that were up closer. <laughs> and so I was riding with the fellow that, uh, that runs the, owns the Chick-fil-A uh, out here, and the two of us, and, and he's got white hair, and you know, mine's coming, so I, he looked at me, and I looked at him, and we shook our heads, no, we're not, we're not 60 yet. We'll hit farther back. Thank you very much. 
having a discussion with our son, and I was talking to him, and I said, now, Dave, I believe the Lord's coming soon. And it's not because I'm old. Because everybody that's old always says that, right? I mean, they always say that. It's like, oh, man, it's rough, it's bad, it's, it's, it's nasty, and, and, it, and it is. And, and truth be known, within our frame reference, it's gotten nastier as time has gone by. And, and sin is greater, and, and it's, it's not good. But I don't say this because I'm old. At least I don't think so. I don't know how many of you pay attention with the advances of technology in our world today. But the advances in our technology have raised serious ethical questions. And last week on 60 Minutes, there was a special on artificial intelligence. I always thought this one teacher was artificially intelligent, but... I, I really never knew what it was. I mean, artificial intelligence like Terminator, you know, like all of a sudden those things are happening. That was always science fiction. They're going to have to change all the labels and make it a reality show soon. Because things are changing so quickly in our day and the ethics of our day begin to ask serious, serious questions came to mind what some of these people have been saying, some of the leading scientists in the world, some of the leading inventors of this world, uh, recently had uh, issued a letter to um, this joint conference, and it was recent, uh, actually about a year and a half ago now, and they warned in that letter that artificial intelligence could be more dangerous than nuclear weapons. Elon Musk, you know, the great inventor, Tesla cars, all of that, very wealthy. He's asked uh, about it. He said, I think it's our greatest existential threat. I find this all very fascinating. Others write about it, say that they agree with this. I know Bill Gates has already started a company called, I believe, Deep Mind, where he wants only his only purpose because he's scared to death of artificial intelligence is he wants to be able to be on the cutting edge and know what's going on with it. All of these things beg huge, huge questions. One professor in California, University of California, Berkeley, of course, um, has decided that he was going to try to work on some of the issues with regard to ethics in this area. And he's come up with a methodology and a process of ethics known in AI as inverse reinforcement learning. And with this, it's a sensor-based system where they observe humans. So the robots observe humans to try to identify the behaviors that would be identified as ethically based. Once a behavior is matched to an ethical modality, code can be reverse engineered to program the AI system. He says this, he says as an example of this process, he pointed out in a recent speech um, that robots might observe people repeatedly boiling water and pouring it over black crystals every morning. And by noting the human's improved mood, the value of coffee ritual becomes codified. He explained later, however, that goals for humans exist in the context of how we have already lived our lives up to the point we receive a new goal. For instance, he says, if we run out of meat, when we're cooking, we know not to cook the family pet. But that value has to be programmed into the artificial mind of the robot. Just recently, a fascinating thing happened with regard to a game. It's an abstract ancient Chinese game called Go. I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's a world champion. And this fellow is so sharp with this game. And scientists have always thought that it was an impossibility to program a computer who would be able to win at this game because it requires so many mental processes, they didn't think it would be ever capable of it. Well, there was a computer built with artificial intelligence at the helm, and it challenged for a million dollars, a challenge went out to this world champion. And three out of four times, the computer won. 
Scientists are saying that this is an enormous, enormous breakthrough. Because what they've done is they've analyzed the artificial intelligence of this computer and found that the computer actually, as the game was developing, was capable of thinking through all of these manipulations. Now, some of this can be used for positive things. If you go to the doctor, a doctor might be able to utilize artificial intelligence to pull from journal articles and, and research around the world that, that no one could ever really put together. And so they're pointing out and saying, well, there's some good things with it as well as some challenges. But I find it fascinating that these world leaders are scared to death of where this is going to go. Part of the reason for it is we have a lack of ethics at the core of our society. And to assume that this is something that will be used for good rather than for evil would be extremely naive. I mean, which one of the two candidates would you really feel comfortable having all of this at their fingertips? Makes you sleep well at night, right? <laughs> Look at our society. There's a reason why we have two candidates like we have. It is, I believe, a reflection of our society. We as a people have been sinking lower and lower over time. Last night I caught an interesting program on TV. It was a presidential debate from 1988. H.W. Bush against Michael Dukakis. We used to have a name for Michael up in Massachusetts. But boy, I'll tell you what, both of those guys look good. You see, we have to be careful and mindful of what is happening in the world today Genome and, and all of the, the, the genome therapies and the abilities to do things that I don't understand with regard to DNA. And the, the group of scientists that are doing this are screaming for someone to come forward in our country and actually be able to develop something from an ethical standpoint because they don't know where to even go with this technology. And so colleges, universities, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, they're all starting to offer bioethic courses where you can get your master's or doctorate in bioethics. We live in a day, and I'm not saying that it's the Lord's coming soon because I'm getting old and I've seen this and I've seen that. They curse way more on TV than back when I was 40 or whatever. I'm not saying that. What I am seeing is an advance in technology that will give mankind unique capabilities that he hasn't had before. And I believe that this is very much like building up to the Tower of Babel when God has to say, okay, that's enough. You can't go any further. You and I need to know that God sees everything that's going on. And just like he was tracking the wickedness of the Amorites, he is tracking the wickedness of this world today. And I believe it's not that long until the smith, the, the craftsman comes forward and that final, final kingdom is smashed to bits and the kingdom of Christ is fully established. Take your Bibles, go back with me to Joshua chapter 3. So what we've determined is that God is a God of holiness, of righteousness, that he alone can bring about this judgment. But let's understand that what is happening here in chapter 3 is one of the greatest demonstrations of a miracle that bolstered the reality of the power of Almighty God. I believe that we as a people need to rejoice over these mighty works. Pick this up here in verse 11. The ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into Jordan. Now then take for yourselves 12 men from each of the 12 tribes, one from each. It'll come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord and the Lord of all the earth rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan will be cut off and the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and when those who carried the Ark came into the Jordan, 
And the feet of the priests carrying the ark were dipped in the edge of the water. For the Jordan overflows its banks all the days of harvest. The waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap. That's the second time he said they rose up in one heap. And this was a, a miracle that took place a great distance, he says, away in Adam, the city that's beside Zarethan. And those which were flowing down toward the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea, were completely cut off. And the priests crossed opposite Jericho. This is a pretty exciting time. I want you to know the magnitude of this miracle because what this does is it paints the picture that our God is all-powerful. Our God is totally amazing. I want you to know, I want you to understand how dramatic this miracle is, how significant this miracle is. This is a picture from 1935 of the Jordan River overflowing its banks and flooding. The Jordan River is a very changeable river based upon the fact that it is so long. There are places where you'll get rapids. There are places where it just kind of sits there, looks like the Mississippi that's overflowed. And it all depends. It's a very deep river, that is true. And when this would happen, it would become quite muddy as well. I want you to show you here where the people of Israel presently are. They're right here opposite of Jericho. And they're all ganged up here, one to two million of them. And they are going to come and besiege Jericho. But notice where the water, the Bible's very specific in where the water begins to build up. And that would be up here in a little place called Adam. That is a significant distance away from Jericho, approximately 18 miles to be sure. When the people of Israel came down to the river, the priests would come to the edge of the river, and the Bible says the priests would step into the edge of the river. And it shows faith on the part of the priests that they would do that. But I want you to know that it wasn't a situation where they stepped into the edge of the river, and all of a sudden, the river just stopped. They would have stood there for a while, because it's way far away, up 18 miles upriver, that finally the water is cut off, and all of that water from 18 miles on down to them has to travel by. No doubt the current got less and less and less, until it was completely past them, and it was dry, so that they could cross over. God makes it sure that this is not a muddy bottom of this he says they cross over on dry land that's a miracle too but this is what I want you to see this is so important for us to understand the water it tells us twice stood up in a heap stood up on a heap how long does it take for you if you pull that plunger up in your sink and you turn on water how long does it take for that water to overflow most of you never have done it, have you? I like adventure. I can only imagine this water overflowing its banks, a ton of water coming down from Adam. And it comes to Adam and it stops. And the water begins to build up and it builds up and it builds up. And it begins to rise up to such a point that it begins to be visible for a long way away. This is a miracle worth talking about. I wonder how high it got. Do you know at 1,000 feet, the top, that water would have been visible out 38 point some miles. If that's the case... Not only would the people of Israel obviously be able to see it down in Jericho, which would take their breath away, but all of these other groups here, the Canaanite people, would also see it. In fact, it would exceed out to this guy fishing off of Joppa. He would notice, he would look up and say, what in the world is that? And remember, who is the predominant God of the Canaanites? None other than Baal. The fertility God and the God of weather. He was the one who controlled water. 
People of Jericho said that their hearts had already melted. How do you think they felt now? You see, this is without a doubt one of the great miracles. And so oftentimes we miss it because we come to Sunday school class and this is what they teach us to look like. Oh, there's the guys and they're standing there with the ark and the water's 10 feet high and it's all set back. And it's like, if, you, if this is how you were taught, you were ripped off. <laughs> Get that up there. I want to see. It. There's no water near these people. The people of Israel didn't walk across and go, oh, no, I hope this doesn't fall on me. Listen, this is 18 miles away and they're watching it and it keeps getting higher and higher and higher and higher. Whew. This is our God. This is our awesome God. This is a miracle for the ages. This is worth talking about in 2016. God is a God who is all powerful and I don't care what's going on in the world around me. I know that my God is in control. I know that he is all powerful. I know that the things that he predicted have already come to pass and those things which are yet future will come to pass. People of Israel were witness to the, one of the greatest miracles of all time. And as they had in front of them a sure path to the promised land, it's the cross of Christ that bridges us to heaven. Where Jesus died on the cross so that you and I could receive the greatest gift ever extended to us gift of eternal life based upon the reality that our sins have been forgiven. Our God is a great God, my friends. When you go from here this week, remember how great and awesome our God is. It would be easy for us to leave this place today and be all pumped up and say, our God is a great God, and then encounter a minor issue in our life and think, oh, I'm all alone here. Forget about the greatness of God. The people of Israel were always tempted to forget or to think of themselves as righteous. Aren't we great? Huh. Whoa. Water? Hey! Let's go. It is God who is doing that. God is a consuming fire who goes across before them. And he goes across before you today. Let's pray. God of wonders, we come to you this morning thankful for who you are. Thank you for the great deeds that you have done. Help us, Lord, today to make certain of our salvation. Father, I'm blessed to be able to say that my faith is in you. I know it's a faith that's well-founded. I know that it's a faith that bears much fruit. Work in our hearts today. And may we live life in the shadow of the realization that you are a God of wonders. Work in our hearts today, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.